All right, welcome back, everyone. So for our second talk today, we'll have Professor Jim Eisenstein give his second talk on this time on how tunneling reveals interlayer correlations in quantum hall bilayers. All right, it's all yours. Okay, thank you. So uh, welcome back. Uh, I'm glad to be back. Um, I want to tell you about, uh, as the title suggests, about what tunneling uh, experiments reveal. Uh, I think you're going to be uh, interested in this. And in fact, one of the um, uh, things worth saying is that although we knew for a fairly long time that, um, meaning of order five years, that or maybe even seven years, that there was an interesting quantum Hall state in bilayers at filling factor one, we didn't have any probes initially of what was going on inside the condensate. Nobody had done Hall drag or anything like that. And a student of mine, Ian Spielman, uh, uh, was given the project of measuring tunneling between the two layers. And we've been doing tunneling in my lab for a long time, but we've never applied it to samples that would reveal the new equal one bilayer exciton condensate. So he got a very good problem to work on. And uh, right away, we found a spectacular result. And that's what I'm going to be focusing on today. OK, so let me see if I can make this thing work. Um, Right, so tunneling, uh, you know what tunneling is. It's sort of the oldest quantum mechanical phenomenon you can think of. Um, tunneling between two metals, like two pieces of aluminum before they go superconducting. Um, so at some temperature above their superconducting transition temperature, uh, a current will flow uh, through a barrier layer, maybe made with an aluminum, aluminum oxide, for example. And that tunneling current, uh, at least if it isn't, uh, if the voltage between the two conductors isn't too large, that tunneling current is just proportional uh, to uh, the current. I'm, uh, that current is proportional to the voltage that's applied. That's a simple result of uh, basic quantum mechanics. Um, something to think about for a minute is uh, the fact that even if the barrier is completely smooth in the direction perpendicular to the page here, so that momentum of the electron, the component of the momentum of the electron parallel to the layer uh, is conserved on tunneling, there's still the momentum in the Z direction for three-dimensional metals. And that momentum is not conserved, obviously, and leads to this rather uh, mundane IV characteristic that the current is proportional to voltage alone. Uh, nothing, uh, nothing sophisticated about it. If you want uh, to ask the question, uh, is tunneling a good probe of uh, correlations? All you have to do is look back to the history of superconductivity in the years shortly after BCS theory, when uh, Javer and I guess others were trying to do tunneling in the same junction that I just showed you, but uh, at temperatures lower than the critical point for superconductivity. And they found this spectacular change in the IV curve. So the green curve is I versus V uh, above the transition temperature and linear, like I just mentioned a minute ago. But when the temperature fell below the transition, uh, suddenly there was this dramatic change and the uh, IV characteristic exhibited two spectacular phenomena that in, they're seen in this picture. One is that the tunneling current, aside from something going on funny right at zero voltage, the tunneling current just vanished for voltages less than uh, some number. And then it would rise up abruptly and then continue on where it might have been had it been in the normal state. And that, of course, was the verification that there was an energy gap in a superconductor. And uh, that's an you know, extremely famous uh, result. Equally famous is this anomaly that you see here in this cartoon picture that even in the presence of zero voltage under the right circumstances, it's somewhat delicate, but under the right circumstances, a current will flow through the junction with no voltage applied at all. This is the Josephson supercurrent of Cooper pairs that are tunneling through the barrier. So I think you know this uh, picture illustrates the power of tunneling for revealing correlations and subtle many body phenomena about as directly as you can imagine. And I'm gonna show you some data that's gonna suggest that in bilayer two-dimensional electron systems in the quantum Hall regime, there's a similarly dramatic uh, result. So we want to tunnel in, in, in these galley marcenite heterostructures that I work with. We want to tunnel from one quantum well to another. And so in order to do that, we have to somehow place a voltage uh, between the two. 
In order to place a voltage, we have to put electrical contacts on these individual layers. And they're separated only by 100 angstroms or so, so it's hard to do this. And people had tried for quite some time uh, various complicated uh, processing steps to make electrical contacts that only connect it to one layer or another. It was very, very hard. This is something incidentally, which and I think I alluded to this yesterday, that in the, in, in the graphene case, it's not hard. And the reason it's not hard is you lay down the layers of graphene separately. Layer number one, insulator, you know, some boron nitride insulator, layer number two, and you just lay it down at some angle so that it doesn't, you know, that you can just attach wires to the parts uh, readily with the soldering pencil, actually. Not really done with the soldering pencil, but you get the idea. But in, in these quantum modes, you couldn't do that. So you had to do something else. And uh, we didn't know anything about graphene, obviously, at the time. So we came up with this scheme back in 1990, which allowed us to do what we wanted to do. We would make contacts in the normal way, and to the diffusion technique, and it always contacted both of the quantum wells simultaneously. So that was not what we wanted. What we wanted is that contact to look at the remainder of the sample, but only through one of the two layers, say in this case, the blue layer over here on the right. And to do that, we used an electrostatic gate to sever the connection to the yellow layer locally near that contact. So that it only, the green contact on the right, only can see the central region of the device through the blue layer. And for every ohmic contact that we would make, and there are many of them, as you can see in this picture down here, they're all over the place, we would attach a separate electrostatic gate to control the densities in the two layers and produce this situation in which, in effect, the contacts only uh, talk to a single layer. Okay, so that's a techn technical thing, and it's nice. and uh, it allowed a lot of experiments and uh, Coulomb drag being one, Hall drag, tunneling, lots of things got enabled by that technology, which was nice. So here we are again. We want to now look at tunneling between these two quantum wells. These are two-dimensional electron gases at zero magnetic field right now. And we try to make tunneling between them. We put a voltage on, we measure a current, then we find out that the IV characteristic, actually the DIDV characteristic, which in three dimensions is just a horizontal line because I is proportional to V. In two dimensions for tunneling between two 2D layers, it's a sharp resonance. It's very, very different than 3D to 3D. Turns out there's an extremely simple reason for this. The reason is that unlike the three-dimensional case, there isn't any kinetic energy or any momentum, if you like, perpendicular to the layers. The only uh, momentum that is conserved. The only momentum you have to think about is the parallel momentum and it's conserved. And because of that, both kinetic and potential energy have to be separately conserved. The result is that tunneling will only occur at a voltage where these two subband edges line up. For this particular picture where the resonance is at zero voltage, the two dimensional layers, each of them have the same electron density. And because of that, the lining up of the bottoms of these bands, which ensures momentum conservation, is coincident with zero voltage. On the other hand, if the, volt, if the layers have different density, it's still true that the, the resonance condition is that the, line, the uh, subband edges have to line up at the bottom, but the Fermi energies won't be equal then. So the resonance will move off to some finite voltage. That's an important point, but we don't, need to think, we don't really need to think about it too much today. Okay, so there's that beautiful resonance. It's very narrow. Uh, in fact, it's much narrower than the, than the Fermi energy of these two-dimensional electron gases, which of course we know perfectly well, but it's very sharply resonant. It's function of temperature, it gets broader. Uh, the resonance, there it is, it's getting broader as I raise the temperature. And you might think, the naive thing to say, the natural, I should call it naive, the natural thing to say is that this is thermal smearing of the Fermi surfaces. And I want you to understand that it's absolutely not true. It has nothing to do with Fermi smear, smearing of the, Fermi, of the uh, uh, Fermi surface, thermal smearing of the Fermi surface. In fact, uh, if you look at that line width, and I'm plotting it in a slightly different way here, but don't worry about this detail. If I plot that line width as a function of temperature, you see it's kind of parabolic in temperature. And these are three different samples. Samples A and B have the same electron densities. Again, this is from the matched density case, but they have different uh, cleanliness or mobility. So sample A is cleaner and the line width is somewhat smaller. 
but the temperature dependent portion of it is identical to sample B. Sample C on the other hand is actually the same as sample B just with the densities reduced. So it has the same uh, line width in, in the low temperature limit, but has a very much stronger temperature dependent. It's still parabolic though. If we take all of the collection of all this data and put it together, we find out that the line width actually is a function of T over T Fermi times the Fermi energy. If I take a, a whole set of uh, data sets and I subtract off the uh, residual line width in the zero temperature limit, I get this sort of universal curve. And what that's coming from, it's a strong hint, is that this line width is not determined by thermal smearing, it's determined by electron-electron scattering. In fact, that's exactly what it is. Uh, it's the lifetime broadening of the levels of a two-dimensional system due to scattering of one electron off of another. And you know that that's uh, you know, a process. There's actually a continuum of electron hole excitations in any, any two-dimensional system. And indeed, one expects the lifetime to be basically T squared uh, for thermal quasi-particles near the Fermi surface. There is a logarithmic correction very difficult to tell whether that is really observed in experiment or not. Uh, there's good agreement between theory and experiment. Uh, it turned out there wasn't initially uh, because there were some mistakes made in early theories, numer just numerical mistakes. But when they got corrected, it still didn't agree particularly well and some higher order uh, many body effects had to, be in uh, had to be included. And these authors that I indicated at the bottom uh, did some work in that way and found out they could get good agreement with experiment. So, okay, fine. I should point out just as an interesting thing, there's a lot of interest in these days in hydrody hydrodynamic regime of uh, low dimensional electronic systems. In, in this data where we were observing that the only thing that really mattered to the line with was electron electron scattering at high temperatures, we were in that hydrodynamic regime. There was nothing else that was important uh, to, the, to the lifetime. I mean, to a, to a high degree. All right, that's not relevant for today, but it's true. And here's a detailed point that I want you to, I, I wouldn't put this up except that we're gonna need it later on. Suppose we do the tunneling experiment, but now uh, like I've been showing so far, but we add a magnetic field and this magnetic field is added parallel to the two dimensional layers. Okay, and let's forget about spin. It doesn't play any role here really. Well, that magnetic field is parallel to the layers. It doesn't create any Landau level. It really doesn't do much of anything, but it does do something. If you think about it, if an electron has to tunnel from one layer to the other, say along this Z axis, it's moving transverse to a magnetic field. And if you sort of make a, you know, a cartoon view that an electron is somehow physically moving from one to the other. So it feels a Lorentz force because of that. That Lorentz force creates a shift in its momentum. Another way to put it is if you, if you prefer, is you can think of the magnetic field that's parallel to the layers as arising from a vector potential, obviously. And I can choose a gauge in which that vector potential looks like these arrows that I've indicated in the picture here. So that, it, <coughs> pardon me, it has a different constant value in each layer. The kinetic energy operator contains that vector potential. And as a result, the two kinetic energy operators for the individual layers are not the same any longer. They're shifted relative to one another by the difference in the Fermi, in the, excuse me, in the uh, vector potential between the two layers. Yet another way to think about that is that the Fermi surfaces of these two layers become displaced relative to one another. Whereas before, without the magnetic field, if the densities were the same, they were two circles and they laid directly on top of one another in momentum space. Now, if I put on this parallel field, they, one shifts relative to the other. So you can see right away that if you're going to tunnel and you're gonna conserve canonical momentum, there's only, unlike the case when there wasn't a parallel field and you could do so all around the Fermi surface, you can now only do so at a point, two points actually, where these two Fermi surfaces intersect. So this is an important thing. Uh, we will use this fact this enables uh, a type of spectroscopy, type of momentum resolved spectroscopy that we will make use of in a few minutes. Let me just point out that in the experiments uh, that we did with this parallel magnetic field applied, the, 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 the strength of this tunneling peak at zero bias was observed to drop off very rapidly initially as the magnetic field was increased, then show a slight bump and then vault, fall all the way to zero. And that's completely understandable in terms of what I've just told you, that at zero magnetic field, 
parallel magnetic field. The Fermi surfaces are coincident and tunneling can occur all around the Fermi surface and give you a lot of tunneling conductance. As you start to pull the Fermi surfaces apart by putting on this parallel field, the tunneling phase space is greatly reduced, becoming just two points, which migrate slowly around the circles as I continue to pull them apart. And if I make the uh, magnetic field high enough, I can actually pull the Fermi surfaces completely apart um, uh, and the tunneling conductance will actually vanish. And we saw that and this uh, verified, I think rather vividly that momentum conservation, canonical momentum conservation was accurately uh, uh, obtained in these experiments. Now let's see what's going on here. Why is that? Oh, I don't know why that's doing that, but anyway, it's okay. All right, now let's go back. Let's, we're, we're interested mostly today in what happens in high perpendicular magnetic fields. So let's start over. And we have again our bilayer system, but now I'm gonna put a magnetic field on perpendicular. Uh, forget the parallel field for a moment. Here in the blue trace in this curve is that same resonance that I showed you before, uh, sitting at zero voltage again, because the electron densities are the same and very sharp, very nice, okay? I put on this big magnetic field, which drives the system way up into the quantum Hall regime. In fact, at this magnetic field, pardon me, uh, the electron, each of the individual electron gases is pretty close to one half filling of the lowest Landau level. And the tunneling, so that, you know, you might imagine some kind of band diagram like this down here on the bottom. Two half filled land levels. It seems like there ought to be some tunneling conductance. Plenty of empty states, plenty of filled states should be something there. And there isn't. The tunneling conductance has been completely squashed. It, it eventually occurs at higher voltages, shows a nice derivative shape, but at zero bias or, you know, over a range of voltages around zero bias, it's just gone. And I should add that unlike the zero magnetic field tunnel resonance, which shifts in position, if you change the electron densities, this suppression region stays fixed at zero voltage. It's a Fermi surface phenomenon. It's a Fermi edge phenomenon. It's not related to uh, the same thing that drives the resonance off zero voltage at zero magnetic field. Okay, so this is a correlation effect and we need to talk about it. Here's the same data or similar data. And instead of plotting tunneling uh, conductance, I'm just plotting the tunneling current. Same kind of a high magnetic field, low temperatures, partial filling of the lowest Landau level. Boy, the tunneling current is just zero. And then it rises up and falls back to zero. Out here, you're trying to tunnel literally into the gap to the next land level. Well, there's no states there. So there's no surprise that there's no tunneling out there. In here, well, the land level is presumably broadened by electron-electron interactions. And that's what this peak is telling you. It's telling you something about the electron-electron-electron-electron uh, electron interaction broadening of the Landau level, but this thing at zero bias is just stuck there and it's very strong suppression. Well, we did a lot of experiments on this back in the early nineties. Here's a bunch of those IV curves, just going up in magnetic field from, I don't know, eight Tesla up to 12 Tesla or something like that, 13 Tesla. And throughout that regime, you're in the lowest Landau level. All, that, all these data are in the lowest Landau level. And everywhere around zero bias, the tunneling is suppressed. This little, you can see these little wiggles in here. That's where the two thirds quantum Hall state is at that magnetic field. But this zero bias suppression does, is a much more robust effect. It doesn't care. It seems to be that there's no density of states. There's a gap all the time. Well, this is crazy, right? I mean, half filled Landau level is supposed to be gapless, right? Half filled Landau level is gap. How can this gap be all over the place? Well, okay, let's talk about this. So, and there's some temperature dependence. I don't wanna talk about that right now. We'll come back to it if somebody asks a question. So in effect, this is what we are seeing. Um, we're saying that the lowest Landa level in tunneling, in tunneling, this is not the thermodynamic density of states, this is the tunneling density of states, possesses a gap at the Fermi level and it's pinned 
to the Fermi level. Wherever I put the filling, there's a gap. And as a result, the tunneling conductance just vanishes. What does that come from? Well, one way to think about it, and you know, sort of at the level that I understand things, is the following. I have these two layers of electrons. I'm in the lowest Landau level. Well, we know that the lowest Landau level is not a non-interacting system. Whether you're in a fractional quantum Hall state that has a real energy gap, or in a compressible state like the composite fermion metal, which does not have an energy gap, all of these systems are strongly correlated. The electrons, all electrons know what their neighbors are doing uh, in one way or another. Well, if I try to take an electron and tunnel it from one layer to the other, I do so, tunneling is essentially an instantaneous process. I have to rip that electron out of one layer and stuff it into the other layer in essentially, you know, zero time. Electron gas doesn't know what, how to do, how to accommodate that because it's so strongly correlated that everybody would have to move. And that motion of everybody takes a long time. In other words, if you make a sharp defect in the electron density in a correlated system, its ability to relax is extremely slow at high magnetic fields. One way to think about that is it make this thing, uh, some big uh, increase in the electron density, tries to flow out and there's this huge magnetic field on. What does it do? It goes around. In circles, it doesn't go out. It once it gets bottled up uh, for a long time, and because of that, tunneling at low energies is very strongly suppressed. At low energies, uh, there is no way for the injected particle at low energies to be anything like the ground state of the system with one more electron added, which takes a long time to establish. Okay, um, there was something else I wanted to say about that. Oh yeah, so here's. Here's a dumb analogy that I like. Imagine uh, you have a, uh, I don't know, swimming pool, and you take your hand and you slam it onto the surface of the water. Well, water it can move out of the way, but not quickly. But you slam your hand onto the water and it hurts, right? Because the, the, the water would like to move out of the way, but it takes some time for the wave motion to remove the water and move out of the way. On the other hand, if you bring that, if you could somehow bring that hand down very, very slowly, well, you can do this. You can just gently push it right into the water, right? It doesn't hurt and the system can accommodate. So in a sense, as a function of time, the water is in even more incompressible um, or in, unable to, 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 uh, to move out of the way rapidly. But if you give it some time, it can move, you know, compared to the wave velocity on surface of water, it can move out of the way. Same thing's true here. Same kind of thing is true here. All right. How big is this energy gap? Well, this argument would tell you it's got to be of order the Coulomb energy between particles. And that's, you know, E squared divided by the magnetic length. Uh, and we can compare that. I think I actually did that in the previous view graph here. That's the mean Coulomb energy given the electron density. It's right about the size of the gap. So that's the scale of things. And again, uh, because we're gonna make use of this later on, note that this Coulomb energy, obviously, is proportional to the density to the one half power, right? That's the inverse of the spacing between electrons. So you know, E squared over spacing between particles. That's gonna be important to keep in mind because we're gonna make use of that as time goes on. All right. Now, a few more things to say about this suppression effect. So here we are again, uh, measuring the uh, zero bias tunneling conductance between two equally, equally dense two-dimensional electron gas layers as a function of magnetic field. I'm not just showing you data at high field and zero field, I'm showing you all of it. This is not the IV curves, this is the conductance of zero bias. And not surprisingly, at low magnetic fields, it starts to oscillate. That's no surprise. There's all these lambda levels starting to form. This is like Shubnikov to Haas oscillations, but in tunneling density of states. But you notice something. Very soon, those oscillations start to fall down. That's the suppression effect beginning to turn on. It's not confined to the lowest lambda level. In fact, we've been able to see it up to, I don't know, lambda level filling 20 something like that, 
you start to see a suppression of the zero bias tunneling conductance. And as you go higher and higher in the magnetic field, it just wipes out the conductance. So here you are way up here at you know, several Tesla around filling factor one. There's just no conductance, okay? And now we come along, this is, by the way is a sample in which the layers are separated widely. So there's no fractional quantum Hall effect at filling factor, uh, total filling factor one or total filling factor one half. These layers are too far apart for that. Okay, so now we get a sample, and this is what took a while to get samples like this developed, that were close enough, the layers were close enough spaced, and we could make these separate contacts that we could do the same experiment, but now uh, in uh, a system with closely spaced layers. So this is what one day I walked into the lab and Ian Spielman had taken this data. And you go, what the heck is going on there? Here's the same thing I just described. Shubnikov de Haas oscillations of tunneling conductance starts to fall to zero. Don't worry about these little bumps. We could talk about them if you want later. Um, and then whop. This just knocked my socks off. I mean, this is one of the most exciting things I've seen in my laboratory in my life. Um, what in the hell was this all about? Okay. Well, we went, you know, we looked at it. Uh, function of temperature, for example, and we found out that that peak grew as the temperature went down. Just the opposite of what happens if the layers are far apart where the tunneling conductance is suppressed at zero bias. Here, here it is magnified by 200 to get it on the scale with a larger separation between the layers. It just gets smaller and smaller and smaller as the temperature goes down and becomes vanishingly small. So this was a completely different piece of physics than the argument that I just made to you about, about strongly correlated individual layers. Now we can look as a function, we don't have to stay only at zero bias, we can look at finite bias and we find the following. And I'm gonna focus now for the rest of the talk on total filling factor one, half plus half equals one. If the layers are too far apart and we do this by this, continuous method of changing densities that I told you about. If I put the uh, sample in this position, this, oops, blue dot, uh, it's too large to show the quantized Hall state, but the tunneling conductance and the tunneling conductance as a result shows suppression, that's the blue curve, shows suppression around zero bias. And then I just change the sample a little bit and move it down here and the IV curve starts showing a resonance again. It kind of looks like zero magnetic field all over again. This resonance is stuck at zero voltage. It's not the same thing as the peak, uh, the momentum conservation peak that I told you about at the beginning. Very, very large conductance, very, very narrow. Um, so Coulomb gap replaced by resonant enhancement. This worked very hard. It turns out it's hard measurement to do it. Uh, to work at really, really low voltages, but you know, Ian was pretty good at it. And we found out that this line width became extremely small. You may not know, but you know, the Fermi energy, for example, of these electron gases is maybe five millivolts. And this line width, sort of the best data that we obtained was less than a microvolt. So this is extremely sharp resonance. Um, tells you this is collective, this is not, single particle physics. Okay, let's compare IV curves. The blue curve you've already seen, that's when the samples on this high layer separation side of the phase boundary and there's a strong suppression. You bring it down below, there's that resonance I just showed you, but in an IV curve, you know, the integral over di dv when it's a basically a delta function is a step. The IV curve now looks discontinuous at zero voltage. That reminds you of the Josephson effect, right? There's a current that flows even though there's no voltage. So 
this is the curve, the set of data that I said, I think is about as dramatic as Javer's original measurement, not with quite such long-term consequences undoubtedly, but the difference between these blue and red curves, it's the same sample. It's just a slightly different density and kaboom, this huge difference shows up. Well, what's going on? I already told you this, that if you're in the incoherent phase, which is half plus half, layer separation a little too large, um, charge defects have a very hard time uh, of relaxing. And that leads in the end of the day to a suppression of tunneling. On the other hand, if I'm in the coherent phase, and it's what we talked about yesterday, you have this exciton condensate that possesses a special condensate that can, can, that can, of excitons, which can uh, be thought of as counterflowing electrical currents. The system is super fluid or very nearly so in that counterflow current. And if the layers are close together, the relaxation of the charge defects is now extremely rapid. It's just the reverse of what it was before because the layers are not doing so, they're not relaxing independently, they're relaxing collectively between the two layers. And this is a super fluid process. And, just boom, this thing just can relax instantaneously. Another way of thinking of this is that if you go back to the wave functions that I wrote down yesterday, it essentially costs no energy because of this which layer uncertainty in the coherent phase. It costs essentially no energy to take an electron from one layer to the other. And the manifestation of that in tunneling is this Josephson, Josephson-like phenomenon. All right, so I already said that. I don't need to show that picture. Um, all right, so great, um, really cool. Uh, this was all done before quantized Hall drag was observed. Um, so that's great. Uh, if we measured the strength of that current, let me go back a picture uh, and define this maximum current up here as a critical current. Um, the strength of that critical current as a function of the layer separation, uh, the effective layer separation, in a single sample uh, by changing densities rapidly collapses to zero at D over L around 1.9 or so in this particular sample. We can measure Hall drag in the same sample and we find the same thing. In other words, whatever the effect is, the Hall, you know, quantization of Hall drag, it vanishes at 1.9 or so. Um, so these two things apparently are talking about the same physics somehow, which would be too bad. It would be too bad if tunneling had nothing further to say than what you learned from transport. In other words, Hall drag or counterflow measurements. But that is not true. And this is why I often uh, ask my graphene colleagues, why the hell aren't you guys measuring tunneling? And here's why. Uh, here's why it's worth doing. And that's the subject of the rest of the talk. I'm gonna talk about three things if I have time. Looking at my watch, I may not get to the last one, um, but I would like to. And well, these are three examples of stuff that you learn from that tunnel spectrum that you cannot learn or you do not learn from transport measurements. Okay, let's talk, let's get going. T topic number one, collective modes. So this is a superfluid, presumably. It has some kind of broken symmetry, broken U1 symmetry. There should be a collective mode, a Goldstone mode in it. What is that Goldstone mode? Well, you may remember, maybe not, I don't know, uh, that the wave function, you can, one way to think about the ground state, if you don't want to talk in exciton language, you can talk in ferromagnetism language. And in that language, electrons uh, lose their memory uh, of which layer they are in. And they do so in the same way for every electron. And they do it with an arbitrary phase uh, in pseudo spin space. The system becomes a ferromagnet, meaning that they all have the same phase phi. All electrons have the same phase phi. And if you try to have two electrons with different phases phi, different linear combinations of up and down, it's going to cost you. It's going to cost you an exchange energy. This is just like exchange ferromagnetism, except it's in, it's in two dimensions. Okay, so there's going to be an energy cost associated with gradients in that phase. That energy cost is crucial to our understanding of the ground state 
and its low energy behavior, there's some quantity that we call the spin stiffness or the superfluid density, usually it's called spin stiffness, um, that, that uh, tells you how much energy attends a gradient in the phase. Okay, it's just like spin waves. It's, except these are pseudo spin waves, just like spin waves, but these are pseudo spin waves in a easy plane pseudo ferromagnet. Okay. In fact, one can write down, this is certainly not me, I mean, I'm copying. Um, one can write down a low energy Hamiltonian for this system, forgetting the charged excitations. This is just for low energy, long wavelength, all that kind of stuff. Um, and there's that term in the energy, a grad phi squared term. There's another term, this beta mz squared, this is very important. If electrons, if a substantial population of electrons fluctuates into one layer as opposed to the other, when the layers have a finite separation, there is a capacitive energy penalty to that. So that's there. And if there's any residual tunneling, which there always is, there's another term, which is an important one. Uh, we rely on this to make any, if T were really zero, the matrix element for tunneling really were zero, I couldn't talk to you about tunneling experiments. The tunneling currents would always just be zero. Wouldn't be very interesting. It's very tiny, but it's there. It explicitly breaks pseudo-spin symmetry, but let's forget that for a minute. You can use this Hamiltonian and figure out what the collective mode spectrum is. This was first done by Herb Fertig in 1989. That spectrum in the limit that there's no tunneling between the layers or negligible tunneling gives you a collective mode. This is the Goldstone mode that is linearly dispersing with wave vector. This existence of this mode is crucial to the understanding of the phase itself. If you don't see this mode, or if it's just not there, then you've got the wrong theory of what's going on. This mode is invisible in transport. It's a neutral mode, okay? And it's, it's got a velocity that's determined by the spin stiffness and the capacitance between the layers, okay? So it looks something like this. It's a cartoon. There's some kind of collective mode where the spin oscillates in some way. Uh, it turns out it, it always oscillates pri primarily in the xy plane, but it does deviate out of the plane by small amounts. That's a that beta mz squared term that I told you about. Um, there's some linear dispersion, and we don't really know what happens at higher wave vector. Um, hartree fock theory predicts a roton minimum. It's not seen in numerical calculations. It's not seen in experiment. It doesn't matter for us today. Tunneling, the experiment of doing tunneling, reveals the existence of this mode. Remember, it, it's in there. It does explicitly break the symmetry. In fact, the mode is ever so slightly gapped at long wave vector, at, at small wave vector, long wavelengths. And that provides us a tool whereby we can see this spectrum, okay? The zero bias anomaly is coming because of that. All right, prove it. I'm gonna prove it now. We wanna know whether we can see that linear dispersion. I mean, yeah, there, it's, not, it's gapped, but it's, it's so close to linear that it doesn't matter. We could never resolve that gap in our experiments. Uh, but can we measure that slope? Well, okay, let's try. So here was the prediction from theory. Um, if the sample were perfect and everything, the phase was homogeneous everywhere around the entire sample, then putting on a parallel magnetic field, this is why I talked about parallel fields earlier today, putting on a parallel field will reveal a dramatic effect because that parallel field injects a momentum. Momentum is zero here where we detect tunneling at zero bias. But if we put on a parallel field, we become sensitive to tunneling at finite wave vector. And that finite wave vector is determined by the same argument that I used before. It's just the magnitude of the parallel field times the spacing between the layers. This is that you know, silly Lorentz force argument I made. So the theory predicted the line rate will split. 
and two resonances will move out. Their voltages will be determined by the wave vector given by uh, this formula and the slope of that line. You know, you just go out to some wave vector and figure out what omega you need, and that's where it should be. Okay, so we did that experiment. This was a hard experiment to do also. All these experiments are relatively hard. Um, and here's what we see. Well, it doesn't look like what I just showed you. Um, there's a giant resonance when there's no parallel field. I've already talked about that. And as the parallel field is applied, the main thing that you see, the main thing that you see is that that resonance is, number one, it's not obliterated immediately, but it gets small very fast. A few tenths of a tesla, it's almost invisible, okay? If you look really carefully and you have lover's eyes, and all experimentalists should develop lover's eyes so that you can see what's going on in your experiment down in the noise, um, you see some little wiggles out there on the outside that you didn't see before. And if you blow that data up, and here it is, zero magnetic field, parallel field, is this thing in this, the bottom. And then there's a little bump with a little parallel field applied. And that bump becomes a little bigger and becomes a little bigger and starts to spread out. And it's moving outward. It may look tiny, but boy, we got excited about that because that is the collective mode. And we measured its wave vector dependence and it was linear and it agreed pretty darn well with simple Hartree-Fock theories for how large that slope ought to be. So this tunneling measurement directly exposed the Goldstone mode and its dispersion with wave vector. So this was a big deal and uh, uh, we, got, we were very excited about it. One can ask, well, Jim, you know, it didn't look very much like your theory. And you're right, it didn't. And the reason for that is actually relatively simple. And we even uh, as experimentalists understood this um, uh, early on. Um, the samples just aren't perfect. There's no way that the phase is uniform across the entire sample. It's broken up, and this is a cartoon here, it's broken up in some way over some coherence length, spatial coherence length uh, given by T. Um, and what is that coming from? It's coming from the fact there's charge disorder all over the place in these samples due to the impurities, due to defects, all kinds of things. And one can make a model in which you ask, if you look at an individual region here, uh, how it behaves with the parallel field. Well, it'll be different than this region, which will be different than this region, which will be different than this region, and on and on and on. And actually, you know, one can do a simple averaging, and lo and behold, you can pull out what this uh, coherence length is based on which how, how rapidly that tunneling resonance fell to zero, the thing in the center. Uh, and turns out it's pretty small. It's only a couple hundred nanometers way bigger than the spacing between electrons, but about equal to the spacing to the charged impurities in the quantum wells or outside the quantum wells, which are there in order to produce the electron gas in the first place. So it made some sense and a much more sophisticated explanation uh, encompassing the same basic ideas was put out in 2011 by Timo Heyer and uh, Bernd Rosenau. So that's pretty well understood, I would say. All right, that's it for that. That's number one. Number two, I wanna talk about another thing that this is much more recent. This is in the last two years, the experiments that, that uh, I no longer have any graduate students. These are experiments that I did uh, after retiring from Caltech, which I am now retired. Um, pairing fluctuations. Well, here's the question, you know, so far, Ignoring what any theorists have told you, uh, there's some kind of exciton condensate at small layer separation. There's some kind of independent electron systems, composite Fermi metals at high layer separation. Question, and there's some kind of critical point, whether it's really a phase transition or not, we don't really know. Um, I could say lots more about that, but I don't have time today. Lots and lots more about that. Um, what happens here? What, what can we say? Well, transport doesn't tell you anything. It's just kind of smoothly varying, no gap, no hull plateau, nothing very exciting. Uh, okay, does tunneling tell you anything? And actually, I didn't know this until two, year, two years ago. Yeah, two or three years ago. Um, 
Turns out it does. And I was really surprised by this. It's a small effect, but it's observable. Here's a graph. Um, first off, red dots correspond to the compressible phase at large layer separation, where the generic tunneling IV curve looks like this. Strong suppression around zero energy. The blue curves are when I've driven the sample by this density trick into the coherent phase. And uh, there's this Josephson critical current business. These are two very different things. Um, I want to parameterize them both. The critical current we've already talked about, uh, it drops to zero as the layer separation increases very rapidly to around 1.9 or so. How are we gonna talk about this? Well, there's lots of ways to talk about it, but what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna kind of define in a somewhat arbitrary way, um, the width of this suppressed region. And I'm gonna define it consistently for all the data points as being the point where the current rises to, I think it was one or perhaps 2% of the maximum value. This gap is a soft gap. It doesn't have a really sharp edge. It's very rapid, but it's a soft gap. It's a pseudo gap after all. It's not really a thermodynamic energy gap. And I'm gonna measure that quantity delta as a function of the layer separation. Now remember, and I sort of indicated this before, the layer separation is only important insofar as its ratio with the magnetic length. The magnetic length is uh, the inverse of the magnetic length at fixed filling factor is none other than the density to the one half power. So if you believe the physics in the compressible phase is dictated entirely by Coulomb interactions within the individual layers, then you're gonna predict that this delta will scale in linear proportion to the density, okay? To the one half power, because it's Coulomb interaction. And that's what this, you know, dash slope is. There it is, it's linearly proportional, but it isn't what the data does. The data, even up here around D over L 2.3, begins to deviate long before anything has shown up in the Josephson uh, effect, it hasn't turned on yet, and long before any Hall drag has showed up, and long before any Hall plateau in the sample has shown up. The tunneling saying something's happening, it's deviating away, the gap is becoming, the, the, the pseudo gap is smaller than you would expect by this amount, and it gets worse and worse, and then collapses rapidly right at the phase point. So this data is saying whatever the interpretation of it is, you know, whether I, what, about, what I'm about to say maybe is totally wrong, what is true is that somehow it knows this transition is coming. It knows the superfluid is about to appear. And other measurements don't show this. Well, let's talk about this in some detail because I want you to believe it. Um, we made a bunch of samples. And we did things like changing the separation between the layers, but maintaining the electron densities the same so that we could you know, separately control inter and intra Coulomb interactions. And we played around with this. And we found out that if the layer separations, again, this is always at filling factor one. If the layers are too far apart, here they are 56 nanometers apart, long, that's, that's basically out in Kansas somewhere by comparison very, very far apart, that value of this pseudo gap width is indeed proportional to density to the one half power, which is what we expected if the layers behaved independently. Whereas in the same density range, all I do is reduce the spacing between the layers, I get this nonlinear behavior, okay? So the suppression is only seen when the layers are close together. This is not some anomaly that is unrelated uh, to the onset of exon condensation. Moreover, if I go only with the sample with the narrow spacings, but I shift the filling factor away from nu equal one to nu equal 0.42 plus 0.42, I picked that on purpose, believe it or not, because um, 
0.4 would be two fifths. And I didn't want to get in trouble with the two fifths fractional quantum Hall effect. And 0.43 something or other is three sevenths. That's the next fractional quantum Hall effect over. I didn't want to get in trouble with that one. So I sat in between. That's what the 0.42 is about. And you notice in the same sample that shows this nonlinear behavior at filling, total filling factor one, at total filling factor 0.84, it's linear again. So again, this tells you that it's very filling factor dependent, cementing this relationship to the correlations that are present, the interlayer correlations that are present in the exciton condensate. I can do a bunch of that, and I can uh, look at the uh, degree to which this gap is suppressed as a function of the filling factor. I showed you this 0.84 data for different layer separations, and I find that there's a minimum around filling factor one. And you can ask me why it isn't exactly at filling factor one. And actually, I don't know the answer to that. I'd love to know. Maybe we'll figure it out someday. There's something experimental going on. But you can see even at very high D over L, 2.5, uh, which is, again, maybe not in Kansas, but it's, it's Nebraska. I don't know. Uh, there's still a noticeable suppression in filling factor one. Okay, so there's something going on. Um, how am I doing here? Oh, pretty good. Um, if I lower the if I lower the effective layer separation a lot, the suppression that's the red curve they come down and drop all the way to zero, and in the middle the supercurrent appears. So there's no question that this there's really no question that the, that this nonlinear suppression of the pseudo gap in the compressible phase is heralding the onset of excitonic superfluidity somehow. Well, I don't know, obviously I don't, uh, this hasn't been uh, studied theoretically. Um, and maybe one of you guys will do that, would be a good problem. Um, I can't pay you, but it would be very nice if you did it anyway. Um, what's going on? Well, uh, uh, large layer separation, an electron in one layer certainly creates some kind of correlation hole in the other layer, but it's very weak, like it's far away. It's just screened out, it's just very tiny, but it's there. But I get really close though. Every electron uh, is gonna create a pretty strong correlation hole in the other layer. Now this is before exciton condensation has occurred. So the electrons haven't yet, every single one of them decided to pair up with another with the vacancy in the other layer to form the condensate. But it's making a pair maybe temporally in uh, the compressible system. And I think it's pretty intuitive that if such a pairing fluctuation occurred, this would produce an electric field that would enhance the ability of this electron to jump across the barrier, thereby suppressing the Coulomb pseudo gap, making the suppression less uh, large, less strong. Okay. Um, so I wanna finish that part of, the, of my talk and geez, I really am almost out of time. Um, to say that it's my belief that these measurements are indicating correlations, uh, excitonic fluctuations of some type in the compressible phase. And I'm, I don't know what, the, uh, there is no theoretical understanding of this uh, yet. Uh, it might be that there's the transition is second order. Um, we thought it was first order in these samples for other reasons that I haven't talked about today. Um, so it's an intriguing problem and it's got some further impetus in the last couple of weeks by this cool idea that Bert talked about that maybe the way to think about this system, at least in some situations, is that there's actually a continuum, a BEC to BCS type crossover, in which even though you're outside the superfluid state, you still have this wave function that involves pairing. Weaker pairs out here, but pairing, uh, becoming weaker and weaker as you get further away. Maybe this tunneling signature is related to that. Uh, idea. I don't know. Uh, again, I think it'd be a good problem to work on. All right, last topic. 
Um, and this is unfortunately complicated and I'm, it's gonna go by fast and um, you're all excused if you now fall asleep, but this is a little bit complicated. Um, all right, let's look at the IV curve again. Now we're back in the exotonic phase and we wanna ask, is tunneling coherent? Is this phase coherent in any way? Uh, you know, I told you I thought disorder was making a static or frozen in distribution of superfluid of, uh, of the phase, but is there some kind of thing that goes over macroscopic distance? So let's look at this critical current. And we do it, uh, here we have a nice four terminal measurement uh, with one of these Corbino devices where I've got contacts on one rim and contacts on the other rim. No edge states are connecting these two. Uh, and I get this curve that's just astonishingly like the Josephson effect. And I can think about it in terms of the Josephson equations, or I'm going to. You know, whether maybe that'll turn out to be wrong, but that's this is the approach that uh, uh, theorists generally take uh, to understand this kind of curve, to think about it, study it. All right, so we can go back, and I don't have time to do this, but we can go back and talk about the question of where does the tunneling actually happen? You know, if I put a battery on. Uh, does the tunneling die off or is it distributed all over the place? I have to appeal to these various equations. That's the Josephson equation for the tunneling, some sine of the order parameter times some energy scale, which in the simplest language is actually the tunnel splitting, but we'll not worry about that for a minute. And there's some transport of excitons, which come from the gradients in the phase times the pseudospin stiffness, okay? And you put these two things together and you say, well, you know, just by current conservation, there's some current going, counterflowing current going away, and there's some current going vertically due to tunneling, and, you know, charge has to be conserved. So you put these things together and you end up with this kind of equation uh, that the second derivative of the phase is somehow proportional to the sine of the phase. This is occurs in superconductors too. This is not peculiar to this. Uh, in Joseph's junctions, not peculiar to this problem. And the, the, the proportionality constant is something known as the Josephson penetration length. Don't confuse this with the penetration depth of the superconductor. This is a different, different length scale. Uh, and it's given by something. And we can estimate this. Uh, we know a little bit about rho s because we did that experiment on the collective modes and we can use it to determine rho s at least to get a good, an educated guess for what it is. The tunnel splitting, well, we know what that is too. At least in a simple model, we can just do, you know, kindergarten quantum mechanics and calculate uh, what the splitting is. Uh, and we get a number. And if I make that number, it says it's about a micron, maybe five microns. It's a squishy number, but it's a number. Meaning that in fact, tunneling does not. This device is 200 microns long, it's, and then the ring diameter is a millimeter. It's a huge thing. Um, the tunneling is going to be stuck within a micron or so of the source and drain context, right? So somehow tunneling is going to depend on the perimeter of the device, not the area. But we got interested in that a long time ago and decided to find out whether tunneling was occurring as a function of total area or the perimeter. Turns out it's the area, and we were. Uh, joined in this by the von Kutzing group, uh, also came to the same conclusion, that whatever this picture is, this lambda j is bigger than the device, even though the estimates of it say that it shouldn't be bigger than the device, it should be small. It doesn't scale with perimeter, it appears to scale with area. This was a surprise, actually. Um, I mean, maybe that naively you would say, of course it's area, uh, but then you think about it, then you go listen to some theorists and they tell you, no, it's perimeter. And then you do the experiment, find out it's area. And so, okay, great, it's area. All right, now somebody yesterday asked the question, what happens if I put batteries on the inside edge and the outside edge? And I said, wait till tomorrow. And this is, this is the most complicated view graph of the entire talk, uh, both talks probably. I'm gonna do exactly what you asked. I put batteries over here and a battery over here. And you notice they're on different, edges of the Corbino rings. So they don't talk through edge channels, okay? And now just, just you're gonna have to swallow some of this probably. Look at the red curve. What the heck is it? And the red curve, 
I have set, these should have a V1 and a V2 on here for, to indicate these voltages. I've set the voltage, let's see, which one is it? I've set the voltage uh, on, in the second layer to be zero. So it's just shorting it together. And I'm measuring the current that flows as a function of the battery over here on the right in both layers. I mean, excuse me, in both, uh, on both edges, both layers, on both edges. Um, and I see in the red curve that I get what I call the supercurrent branch. The current number two is, rises up very, very steadily and no current at all flows over on the other edge. Right, it's just, uh, this is the horizontal axis is the current measured over at I1 until I exceed the critical current with the circuit on the right. And the system goes into a resistive state analogous to the resistive state of a Josephson junction above the critical current, very analogous. And suddenly current begins to flow over here on number I1, circuit I1, and I can detect it. That's what the horizontal position of these red dots is. There it is, half a nanoamp. Okay, all right. Okay, now, now comes the really confusing part. Now, <clears throat> I put a battery voltage on the left-hand circuit and I leave it fixed. Doesn't matter what it is, well, it matters what it is quantitatively, but just it's some number, 100 microvolts, something like that. And I go and do the same damn experiment. I sweep this battery and measure both currents. And I get the black curve. There's the supercurrent branch where I2 is varying, you know, very, very rapidly. But I1 is fixed at about a nanoamp. Oh, sorry. Someone has a question for like right now, I guess. Okay. So I'll unmute this person. Uh, what is that question? Oh, here we go. You want me to look at it? And... I don't know. I, I think he's going to speak. Sha um, I oh. was just typing. Oh, I guess I clicked this is the wrong button. But oh, uh, I could wait until the end. Okay, why don't you? I'm almost done. So why don't yeah, you, sure. why don't you okay. hold on? Sorry off. to interrupt. That's quite right. Not a problem. Uh, so let's see, what was I saying here? Yeah, so, so you notice that the critical currents for I2 in this peculiar situation where I've biased the other side of the circuit are now different. The magnitude of the jump is the same as it was, but the values are different. They're different by precisely the one nanoamp that's falling on the other side of the circuit. What this means is, is that the critical current is actually the same. The total current that flows through the device before the supercurrent break, before it breaks down into the resistive state has stayed the same. In other words, this black curve is shifted downward by one nanoamp, just as circuit number two is carrying one, circuit number one is carrying one nanoamp. It's confusing. But what it's telling you is that the circuit on the opposite edge is talking to the circuit on the left-hand edge, on the right-hand edge, through the insulating void 200 microns wide. Okay, this is, and, and, and if, you, if you do the thing in the opposite polarity, you get the opposite result, not surprisingly. The actual critical current is the same. It's the total current that matters. So the system in this sense is coherent, at least over that 200 micron distance. This is something which was not revealed uh, really by the determination that the tunneling conductance was proportional to area, but was certainly suggested by it. Um, so this tells us that somehow uh, the system is in a global uh, coherent phase. Uh, let me. Why does that happen? There we go. Uh, so go back to this cartoon picture. And, uh, uh, I've already said everything here. This is again, a cartoon of this double, double biased experiment. Uh, you can obviously solve this equation very easily. Uh, and it requires this lambda J parameter to be far bigger than what theory would have suggested. 
based on the raw parameters that we would put in. Do we understand this a little bit? I've told you already before, there's all kinds of quenched vorticity in this system due to charge disorder. And because of that, uh, a couple things are true. One is that there are domain, you can think of the system as though it's almost broken up into domains of phase pointing in different direction. But this uh, experiment is telling you that if you try to vertical current, go above vertical current, the phases big rotate everywhere globally. So these two phases in two different regions are not the same, but then when the voltage appears and the phase starts to change with time, you know, through the Josephson equations, they both could go together. I don't know if that makes sense or not, but that's the general picture. And the idea is that because of all this quenched vorticity in the system, the way to calculate this lambda J that I told you uh, involving the tunneling matrix element and the spin stiffness is not to change the spin stiffness, but to renormalize uh, the tunneling strength uh, due to the quenched vorticity. And this is not something that I've done. This is uh, uh, done by responsible theorists who have licenses to do this kind of calculation. I don't. Um, and they uh, indeed conclude that uh, the effective Josephson penetration depth becomes macroscopic because, oddly enough, because of disorder. All right, I'm done. Uh, I want to just put up some conclusions and then we can go on to some questions if you have them. Um, and I think that what I want you to take away from this uh, is that tunneling exposes aspects of the excitonic condensed state uh, and its uh, essential aspects, like, and I think most importantly, uh, the uh, observation of the linearly dispersing Goldstone node, which is crucial to understanding superfluidity. Uh, you, you see it in these experiments. Uh, these effects are not detectable, at least not in any obvious way, to ordinary resistivity or Coulomb drag or counterflow experiments. Um, so that's nice. It makes tunneling a very worthwhile thing to do. In earlier tunneling experiments in the double layer graphene system, as far as I know, they haven't been done. Probably somebody's going to yell at me in a few minutes that they have been done, but as far as I know, they haven't been done. Uh, they should be done. Uh, and moreover, uh, I think uh, for all you uh, young aspiring physicists out there uh, that are listening to this, there's a lot to do in this, both uh, experimentally and theoretically. Uh, understanding this idea of pairing fluctuations above the critical point uh, would really be a good problem to work on. Why do those pairing fluctuations suppress the tunneling pseudo gap? Uh, that to me, you know, in my naive uh, experimentalist approach, I, I look at a theorist and say, why can't you solve this problem? Well, why can't you at least get a, an idea of why those fluctuations would produce this effect? Uh, so maybe one of you guys uh, will take up this problem. All right, thanks a lot. All right, thanks for the wonderful talk. It's beautiful results. Okay, so we have questions? Yes, we have a few, quite a few questions. So the first question is, what causes the bump in tunneling conductance before it falls off? Um, let me make sure that I know what you're talking about. Um, do you mean, in, are you talking about the condensed, the uh, exotonic phase or, or this region where it's like this? Um, I think maybe the asker is raising their hand. I'll unmute them. Hi. Hi. Who's somebody talking? Yes. Can you hear me now? I certainly can. Yes. Ah, the, um, I think it was more towards the beginning of the talk. Um, th Just tell me when to stop, okay? Uh, sure. Oh, I think you maybe went too far. Here? Uh, you, you, uh, I have it in my notes. One moment, sorry. No problem. It was the conductance, um, it, it was a huge result. It was like the first big wow that you mentioned. Okay. Um, 
There was a blip, you know, it, it started going, it fall, fell off and then there was a blip and then it fell off completely. You're talking about this curve? No, no, before this, before this. Yeah, actually, before okay. this. Uh, well, I'm not sure what you... Oh, I think right, a uh, little bit more, a little bit more. Ah. Ah, here, here, here. That? Yes. <laughs> That's very interesting. Um, you know, I love every aspect of these graphs and that one I really like a lot. So it's a, it's, it's a phase space effect, basically. Um, uh, you know, if, if there were no uh, scattering at all, if, if the lifetime of particles were infinite, then in fact, the tunneling conductance formally would be infinity, even in the, even in the case of uh, non-interacting electrons. This, now, when these two, uh, at, for zero magnetic field, zero parallel field, these two Fermi surfaces would be sharp at zero temperature. It doesn't matter about the temperature. And, and there would only be one voltage at which they uh, would tunnel and it would be zero and it would be infinite. And of course, that's not true, but that's what it would be in the absence of any uh, uh, disorder. When you start pulling them apart, so that's really because the phase space of two circles on top of one another is essentially just, it's, it's singular. As you bring them a farther apart, the word is they osculate, which is another fancy way of saying they kiss. Just as they're, just as they're leaving each other, there's a weak divergence. Turns out it's not as strong as it when they're on top of one another, but when they're just kissing like this, there's a one over square root of B minus B critical divergence of the phase space. And that divergence is rounded by the presence of, of scattering and disorder. But otherwise, this would go up and show, a sh uh, in principle, an infinitely sharp uh, peak. So it's a phase space effect. Uh, that's, I hope that answers the question, but that's what it is. Thank you. Uh, no problem. Great question. This is a good question. All right, the next question is, why is there a peak in tunneling current when the magnetic field is increased on the fermiology slide right before it drops to zero? I guess this is the same question. It sounds so. like it's the same question. Yeah, uh, I guess you, mean, asked you mean this rise right here? Yeah. Uh, I think that's the same thing. The phase space of two kissing circles is beginning to show up uh, as they're just about to separate. So, you know, you guys can go home and calculate this yourself. I used to give this as a problem in quantum mechanics at Caltech is to figure out how that worked. Uh, you'll see that that phase space has this one over square root of discontinuity. It goes up as one over square root of B minus the critical value and then slams down to zero uh, in the ideal non, uh, no scattering case. So that's why it rises. Popular question. Yeah. All right, regarding the beginning of your talk, how does the requirement of in-plane momentum conservation change the DIDV curve compared to the local tunneling case in which there is no momentum conservation? Oh, um, so I didn't do any experiments on, on point contacts where there's no momentum conservation. Is that, what you're, is that what the question is about? I think, let me go back, um, boom. So you're not talking about the difference between 3D and 2D, are you? I'm not totally sure I understand the question, but let's just, let's, let's, uh, let me try to say why this occurs in a different way. So, and I don't have a, I don't have a blackboard. I didn't hook up my, I should have hooked up my, uh, my uh, laptop. I mean, my, yeah, my laptop. But anyway, imagine the, 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 the energy dispersion relation for each of these two layers. What is it? It's just a parabola. And it's a parabola uh, in uh, you know, two dimensions, X and Y. Uh, and each of the two parabolas, uh, if the electron gases are, are the same, not same density, but are this, just the same effective mass, those parabolas have the same curvature, right? If I want, so just imagine one dimension, I've got one parabola like this and the voltage is, is non-zero and so the other parabola is displaced. 
For an electron to tunnel, it's going to conserve momentum, which just means it has to lie on a vertical line separating those two parabolas. Well, if it does that, it can't conserve energy because the two parabolas aren't on top of one another. The only time it can conserve energy in two dimensions is when the two parabolas lie directly on top of one another. In three dimensions, that's not true because there's another dimension allowing you to have a continuum of kinetic energies at each individual in-plane momentum. You don't have that in two dimensions. Now, I'm not sure that's what you were asking, but that's the reason things are resonant in 2D to 2D and not resonant in 3D to 3D. Now, if I did 2D to 2D, but instead of being really 2D, I made some you know, quantum dots uh, and so small that momentum conservation didn't occur, then I would expect not to find this. Uh, that momentum conservation would be irrelevant. Maybe another way of saying that is, what would this look like if the scattering was so enormous that momentum, the, the life, it's really saying what's, that the lifetime of momentum state was zero, uh, this curve would be extremely broad. In other words, it would be a lot like the 3D to 3D case, but that's not the case. These barriers are very smooth, the electrons have uh, uh, very little scattering with their neighbors uh, at zero magnetic field. It's so heavily screened. Uh, so you get good conservation of momentum. So I don't know whether I've gotten your question answered or not, but that's what I think you were asking. Okay, what else we got? So why is the pseudo gap delta expected to be linear in D over L when there is no interlinear correlation? If it is proportional to the Coulomb energy E squared over L, delta should intersect zero at D over L equals zero, but it doesn't wow. seem to be in general. Smart guy. I'm always amazed at how much people see in these pictures that I'm not talking about. <laughs> you ask a great question and I don't have the view graphs here to go into it, but I'm going to tell you what happens. Yeah, if, if I, assuming I've understood it properly, let me gotta find the right place here. Let's go here. Okay, I think what you asked is why don't these dashed lines extrapolate to zero energy at zero density? Is that right? Am I? Um, understanding what was bothering you. Uh, okay, and let me unmute him. Yeah, go ahead. And... Uh, yes, uh, that's exactly what I'm asking. Great, okay. So in fact, you can ask another question. That's the same question, really. Uh, why are these curves vertically displaced from one or by so much? Nobody asked that. If everything's due to intralayer Coulomb interactions, you could say, Jim, what the hell are you talking about? They're very different. Okay, so there's another effect that I didn't talk about. And it's something that I like to call a final state excitonic attraction that has nothing to do with excitonic condensation in the initial electron gases. So let's suppose we have two conductors. A principle could be regular metals. Uh, and I take an electron and I pull it out of one, let one metal and I stuff it in the other one. What's gonna be left behind? Very, for a very brief moment, there's an electron in, having tunneled over and a hole having left behind. Those two things attract one another in the final state. And as a consequence, they lower the net penalty for tunneling in the first place. Now, in ordinary metals, this effect is so small, I don't think it's ever been seen. Why? Because screening is ridiculously good in ordinary metals. The screening like an aluminum, the half an angstrom or something like that, you'll, you'll, you won't, these, these things will not, not be detectable at all. I have this vague memory that somebody claims they did detect them, but, but nevertheless, at high magnetic fields, that's not the case anymore. The screening length in gallium arsenide it's about 50 angstroms. These barriers are about 100 angstroms. 
So it's not true any longer that this can't be a measurable effect. And I did a series of experiments in the early 90s in which we quantified this. And we looked at different layer separations. This was not at filling factor, it was at filling factor one, but it was not in the exotonic phase. We hadn't even discovered the exotonic phase yet. It was just in data like this, this 56 nanometer sample. And we changed the spacings and various things. And we found out that these data curves always extrapolated back over here far on the left uh, to a negative value, not positive, negative. It keeps going and if you could go all the way back to the left, it would actually cross the axis and go negative. And that negative number is the attraction in the final state of the electron and hole. And in fact, we got rather good quantitative, quantitative agreement with simple theories of how strong that effect would be. At the 30% level, we got the actual magnitude of that exotonic correction uh, right. Uh, these two samples, 56 nanometers and 28 nanometers. Well, 56 nanometers is bigger than 28. So the exotonic attraction in the final state in the 56 nanometer sample will be, will be weaker because they're farther apart. And that's a negative correction. So it's become a smaller negative number, meaning it raises the apparent value of the pseudo gap in the positive direction in going from 28 to 56 nanometers. And that, my friend, is the explanation for why these curves don't extrapolate to zero. The way that, and I'm going to congratulate you on being able to detect that <laughs> without me highlighting it. Uh, sorry, I don't think I fully understood. You mean like the final destination is like after this electron tunnel into another layer and this electron weighs the whole layer have an attraction term? Is that what you mean? Yes, exactly. Exactly. Uh, so why is that negative if it's further apart, but the, it's positive when you have like, when you have thinner inter separation? Is that what I say? Yeah, uh, it's less negative. In other words, that the value of this gap is, uh, let's go back a, a little bit and forget about this final state effect for a minute. Value of the gap is basically determined by intra-layer Coulomb repulsion. And if there were no final state effect, these two samples should have shown the same dependence and there shouldn't be this vertical offset. So it's a penalty. You have to pull the electron out of one layer, that costs you some energy. You have to stuff it in the other layer, that costs you some energy. And the sum of those two energies is the value of the pseudo gap that you observe. Except that the cost also has to include any cost or benefit associated with this final state exciton. The final state exciton makes it less prohibitive to tunnel. So because of this attraction in the final state, it's attraction in the final state. So if I make the layers farther apart, there's not as much attraction. So I don't get as much benefit. So the curve stays up high. If I bring the layers closer together, there's more final state attraction, which reduces the penalty for tunneling and the curve falls down. So the signs are all correct. It just takes a while to spin them around in your head to, to realize that. Um, I see it. I think I, I got it. So the, for the 28 nanometer, you mean uh, there is inter layer attraction essentially making the it to be right. opposite side of the... Okay. Right. Yeah. Okay, right. thanks. Cor correct. That's correct. I think we only have time for one or two more questions. Okay. All right, the next question is, why is DIDV less than zero at small voltages? I guess this person's referring to the resonance and- Yeah, the, yeah sure. goes. that's a, a common question. Um, here is a, do uh, you talking about zero magnetic field or high magnetic field? I guess you want zero magnetic field. Let's, let's I think this here. question popped up near the beginning of the talk, so okay, all before right. you talked about the field. All right, all right. Let's go back there and ask. Oh, that's not it. Oops. No, that's not it either. That way, we could have used that. Let's use this. No, that. Um, you're talking about this? 
Is that what? Yeah, that's I the, think that's the, that's the negative. About. So it's a negative conductance, not a negative current. It means that if you were to um, take this data and integrate it or measure directly the IV curve, it simply means that as a function of energy, the current has fallen off. And that's what you expect. If you have two levels that are out of alignment and you start to bring them close together, the current goes up for a while. There's more and more tunneling because they're closer and closer, but then it starts to fall again because they're going out of alignment. And as the current starts to fall, the differential resistance or the conductance, the IDV is negative. That's all. There's no, nothing magic happening here. The same thing is true um, there. This is at high magnetic field now. And as I take the voltage up and the lamp, you know, you start getting out of the Coulomb gap and you're sitting in the, you're tunneling at high energies and you're just pushing everybody out of the way. You've got so much energy. Uh, eventually, you run into the reality that you're coming close to the gap to the next Lando level, which is in Kansas again, right? So your current's gonna fall. And it certainly does, it drops down dramatically. And as that current falls, di dv is negative, just like it is here. Positive, and then it's negative. Just like it's zero magnetic field, it's positive and it's negative. That's all there is. And nothing, nothing uh, subtle going on there. All right, great. Thank you so much. I think that's okay. all we have time for. All right. I guess maybe I could send you the rest of the questions. I think they're. Yeah, that'd be fine. And then maybe we can yeah. post the answers to them on on the website. That's. Um. We'll fi we'll figure something out. But I'm. Yeah, happy. we'll figure something out. Well, everyone's questions to... will be answered. <laughs> well, I didn't say that. <laughs> I said every, everyone's questions will be addressed. Uh, whether they'll get a, good, a satisfactory answer out of me, I don't know. Good luck. <laughs> Who knows? All right. Thanks very much, everybody. Thank you so much, Professor Eisenstein. You're welcome.